Hello everybody and welcome to the Carl Am Cymru revision sessions. The session this evening will focus on photosynthesis part one as part of our A2 level biology and will be presented by Mr Cobb from Iskol Abitefi. The session will last around 45 minutes where Mr Cobb will run through the relevant content. If you have any questions during the session please use the Q&A section and we'll do our best to answer you. You will see that there is a hyperlink in the Q&A section if you're happy to leave your name and email address, we would love to keep in touch with you so that we can send you information about future events. You can click on the link at any time during the session. Today's session will be recorded and the recording and any relevant resources will be uploaded to the ESCOL website under the Carl Am Cymru tab. Thank you, Mr Cobb. Over to you. Good evening, everyone. Right, uh, photosynthesis is a tricky topic, um, and what I intend to do over the next, uh, well, over the two sessions that I'm running this, um, to get through as much as possible, um, so that you can, uh, hopefully, you can clarify some things, and hopefully, you'll, you'll have the opportunity, of course, because they're recorded, to come back and and uh, look at these videos again. So, here's the plan for today. Um, uh, well, here's the plan for the next two sessions then that uh, that I'm covering. So, we're going to look at some basics of photosynthesis. Um, and look at the role of the pigments. We're going to scale that up into photosystems and how those pigments are arranged within photosystems and their role within photosystems. And then we're going to get on to the, 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 the real business part of this, which is the light dependent stage and, and the light independent stage. There's, there's some, some, some argument to say that I should just go straight into the light dependent stage, but that's not really going to work very well. We need a bit of background first. We need a bit of a foundation so we can then um, make more sense of the light dependent stage. So the light dependent stage, as you're probably aware, is divided up into, um, well, two, if you like, the non-cyclic photophosphorylation and cyclic photophos photophosphorylation. We will deal with each of those in turn and look at their uh, relevance. And then finally, uh, the light independent stage of photosynthesis. Now, such a big topic, so much going on. It's not realistic to get through all of that in one session, so I'm going to cover as much as I can today, and then in the next photosynthesis, the part two, we'll cover the rest. So we're going to look at a little bit for me to begin with, and then a little bit of you, uh, so a few exercises you can do to try and stay on top of things. We'll look at some past member questions during the course of the session too. So hopefully over the course of the whole lot, you'll get a good flavor of as what it is you're expected to, to know and how you can apply that. Right, so let's have a look at the basics then to, uh, to begin with. So look, what do we know? It's the photosynthesis is the way in which plants use light energy to synthesize organic molecules. And really, we're talking about glucose more than anything else. Um, so we have carbon dioxide and water converted to glucose and oxygen. That's from GCSC, so that should be fine. Where it takes place, well, we know it takes place in the leaves. But really, we need to do a little bit better than that. This is still from GCSE, but OK, we'll, 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 you could be forgiven for, forget, for forgetting. So we're looking at this layer here, the Palisade mesophyll uh, layer. Uh, so there you can see that those uh, um, cells in that layer are sort of on their end, uh, upright, if you like. Palisade actually comes from the oh, Greek or Latin for um, soldiers, I think, actually. And if you think of a palisade fence, you might be familiar with that. That's got definite uprights, uh, a palisade fence. So the idea they're standing upright, uh, those cells. Um, they're packed with chloroplasts because we know chloroplasts contain chlorophyll, which is all about absorbing light. Chloroplasts are focused on photosynthesis, so that makes perfect sense. Um, and also those chloroplasts are actually able to move intracellularly they're able to move around that uh, that palisade mesophyll cell and intra means within so they're able to move within the cell um, to the um, area of the cell which is getting the most light so they can get in that best position to get as much light as possible now having said that here's our first one so have a little look at what's going on here. I'm going to give you a couple of, uh, well, I'm going to give you maybe 10, 15, 20 seconds. You can always pause the video uh, and see if you can remember what I've gone through there. Okay, so um, going back to the first thing, one, two, three, or four, just the equation. So I've got um, carbon dioxide and water, either order. Uh, glucose and oxygen being produced either order either order there the fact that photosynthesis mainly occurs in the remember it's the palisade tissue um, 
of the leaves as these are near the top of the leaf and they're packed with chloroplasts and the chloroplasts are able to move intracellularly. Inter means between, intra means within. Now, taking you back now to, we're going to need this today, taking you back to AS. Can you remember the different parts of the chloroplast? So you can see there's a few things on there which I haven't asked you to name. The starch granule, the lipid globule, ribosomes, chloroplast envelope. I'm not really interested in that. We really need to get to the uh, important part. So number one there, that's the stroma. Think of the stroma as being like the cytoplasm of the chloroplast. Number two, these are referred to as the thylakoid membranes. OK, so we'll be looking at thylakoid membranes later. Um, a stack of thy oh no, we're over here now. Number three, uh, this is not really relevant here, the circular DNA, but it, but the reason I think this is significant is because it's really common to be asked about the fact that both chloroplasts and mitochondria have their own circular DNA. They are self-replicating. It's worth keeping that in mind. But really, that's that's sort of a, 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 a an aside. Um, we'll be talking about photosynthesis because now I've talked about thylakoid membranes. A stack of thylakoid membranes is referred to as a, a granum or grana is plural. Stacks of thylakoid membranes. OK. So let's move on to the photosynthetic pigments. So we know that photosynthetic pigments are all about absorbing light. If I asked you to name one photosynthetic pigment, I would suggest you would give me chlorophyll. And that's absolutely spot on from GCSE. But at A level and at A2, we have to go a little bit further because there's more than one photosynthetic pigment. So there are, in fact, two types of chlorophyll molecule. There's a chlorophyll A, which appears blue green. <coughs> Excuse me. And there's a chlorophyll B which is yellow green. So when we ask to say about the color of chlorophyll, yes, we say green, but really we've got two types of chlorophyll and they're different shades of green. Those are not the only pigments there, um, but if I show you about those pigments where they um, absorb light, uh, we can see that if you look at chlorophyll A, this is telling us, so what this is, let's just clarify what, what we're doing here. We can go back a section here. So look, along the bottom is our, um, the electromagnetic, electromagnetic spectrum, but of a visible light only. So we know that visible light is divided up into multiple uh, colors, like the colors of the rainbow, um, and those correspond to different wavelengths. So 400 nanometers is in sort of the blue purple region, 700 nanometers is in the uh, uh, orange red region. So what's this telling us? This look on the left hand side is the amount of light absorbed. So chlorophyll A, the blue green, it absorbs mostly in this blue region and this orange region, you know, orange red region. Importantly, look where it doesn't absorb. It doesn't absorb in this blue green region. OK, it doesn't absorb there, which is why it appears blue green, because the wavelengths of light that it actually doesn't absorb or it reflects are the blue green um, wavelengths. If you look at chlorophyll B, well, it's not too dissimilar. Um, you can see that it also has a, a peak in the blue region. It also has a peak around the orange region. It doesn't show it perfectly here, but really this also doesn't absorb. You see it absorbs a little bit more in that bluer region where chlorophyll A um, didn't, but we've got a it's the that's sort of the blue green region or yellow sorry yellow green region over here where we don't have absorption so we have reflection okay so which is why chlorophyll a appears blue green chlorophyll b appears yellow green and indeed why chlorophyll a and b collectively appear green because there's this region in the middle where there's no absorption now if those were the only pigments available to a plant, and they are, they do form the majority of the pigments in a, in a leaf. If they were the only pigments, if we were to get rid of those a moment and change the y-axis and convert that into what's the rate of photosynthesis, well, what we're going to see is something that looks a lot like that. What this is saying is that, look, the rate of photosynthesis is high where there's lots of absorption. The absorption of the, uh, the the chlorophyll A, absorption of chlorophyll B, more absorption equals a higher rate of photosynthesis. So we know if we were to shine a light of blue light on a leaf, we would get photosynthesis taking place. We would get photosynthesis taking place. Same if we sh shine orange or red light onto a leaf, we would get photosynthesis taking place. If we were to shine green light on a leaf, 
we would get virtually no photosynthesis taking place. And this is kind of wasted at the moment. But there are additional photosynthetic pigments uh, that are uh, possible to be seen within a plant. So there's carotene, which is an orange pigment. And if you look at the absorption spectrum of carotene, you can see that it's got a um, uh, greater absorption, or rather it's got no absorption in the orange region and more absorption in that blue region. There's also xanthophyll, which is a yellow pigment. And if it's a yellow pigment, uh, that's telling you that it doesn't have much absorption. It's, I'll put it in there, but actually there isn't much down here. This is where there wouldn't be much absorption down here, so it would appear yellow. Now, what is the point of additional pigments? There are other pigments as well that absorb in different regions, but you know, this is a good idea of you've got a general spread of different pigments. If we now look at the rate of photosynthesis, you can see how it's changed that now we do actually get a little bit of photosynthesis happening even in that green region. It's not a lot, um, partly because there isn't a huge amount of absorption um, by xanthophyll, but also because there aren't many carotene and xanthophyll pigment molecules present within a leaf. There are some, but the majority are chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B. So why is this relevant? Well, look, the whole idea of having multiple pigments is to absorb light energy at different wavelengths over a wider range of wavelengths. So each pigment absorbs light energy, yes, but each pigment absorbs light energy at a different wavelength or uh, a few different wavelengths. Um, having more than one pigment means that we uh, the plant is able to absorb a wider range of wavelengths. So this graph is not uncommon to ask, what does this graph tell us? It tells us that those pigments which are, so I mean, I'm talking about all the, the lines we've seen there, those pigments which are absorbed are the ones involved in photosynthesis. That's a, a quite a common question. Right, little recap here, what can we name on there? I'll give you um, a few moments to have a look and uh, you can always pause anyway. OK, so. Number one, what's number one on there? This is showing me my uh, action spectrum. It's the um, uh, actually. So I didn't mention this term, actually, but it's, this is showing my rate of photosynthesis, my the how much photosynthesis is happening. Um, at each wavelength and you can see I've got a purple rate of photosynthesis um, uh, scale that was uh, uh, label sorry and that matches the purple line I'm seeing here so this is my rate of photosynthesis line also known as the action spectrum I got carotene and xanthophyll on there but I'm not really too fussed about those because the most important one is to identify a, a chlorophyll a the blue green and chlorophyll b the yellow green the function of the pigments is to absorb light energy, but they do so at different wavelengths and therefore together they allow a plant to absorb a wider range of wavelengths. I've underlined it because I'm saying look, this is important. We remember that. Right. OK, I'll try and do this quickly. It's worth um, appreciating that the practical implications of well, I see the implications or the applications then of uh, the different photosynthetic pigments that they can be separated and identified using chromatography. And the stages involved um, when you um, are separating pigments, you extract them using a um, pestle and mortar. So you grind, you might chop up the leaf and then use the pestle and mortar with a solvent like propanone or ethanol can be used. You grind them up and that releases the pigments. Then you, ex you um, uh, take that extract that you've made and you spot it or you make it you put a multiple um, applications usually using a piece of capillary tube um, onto that uh, origin line on a piece of chromatography paper then you take that chromatography paper and you put it into a glass tank uh, containing a solvent you just suspend it that way so there's your glass tank here and this blue thing here represents the solvent which again is likely to be the same solvent you've used at the start like propanone and the solvent then rises up um, the chromatography paper and as it does so it will separate uh, out those pigments on the basis of their solubility so you can see what different color pigments there which have stopped at different points on the chromatography paper the more soluble pigments get further up when the solvent reaches the top the paper is dried uh, taken out and it's dried and then you use that to calculate the rf value and the rf value is the distance traveled by the compound so you measure that from the origin line 
divided by the distance traveled by the solvent and that allows you to identify the pigments you can identify these different pigments because they have a definitive exact um, rf value now, i did that quite quickly because it's particularly relevant given we just talked about pigments but let's move on and get to the to uh, more pressing matters so have a look at this question again you can pause worth having a go and i'll come back in a few moments Okay, so quite straightforward. There's three photosynthetic pigments found in the leaves of green plants. Uh, take your pick. It would be weird if you did not choose chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B, but there's other ones in there, and they mentioned xanthophyll and carotene. Advantage of having more than one photosynthetic pigment is, like I said, allows light of a different wavelengths to be absorbed, or I prefer, in fact, absorbs over a wider range of wavelengths, so that's usually a better answer. What's an action spectrum? Well, that's going to show the rate of photosynthesis taking place at different wavelengths another question here says the pigments for photosynthesis are held in chloroplast we know this the pigments are and they give you those um state precisely where the chloroplast the pigments are found now this is a nice little segue onto the next thing we're going to do because we haven't talked about this yet but those pigments are found within thylakoid membranes okay now we're going to look at that in a moment so they talk about the thylakoid or granum because that's a stack of thylakoids they talk about lamellae which are uh, where you get um, thylakoid membranes linking to grana, and then we're looking at antenna complex and light harvesting units we'll talk about next. Name the specific pigment that loses an electron on the light independent reaction. We haven't talked about that yet, so this is like an intro here, chlorophyll A, but then we have this function of accessory pigments. What do they do? They absorb light energy and pass on to a primary pigment reaction center, and it increases the range of, wave, range of wavelengths. But you know, there's an awful lot of that second question we haven't talked about yet, so let's do that now. Little recap, two pigments found in the leaf, carotene A, chlorophyll B, carotene, uh, sorry, I said that wrong, chlorophyll A, chlorophyll B, carotene xanthophyll. Where are they found? They're found in the thylakoid membrane of chloroplasts. Process used to separate leaf pigments, chromatography. Why have more than one? Absorb over a wider range. And what do we call, uh, to call the graph that shows the rate of photosynthesis at each wavelength of light? It's the action spectrum. So now what we're going on to, stages of photosynthesis but firstly um we're going to go on to photosystems so a little re little intro to that first stages so we know it's a series of chemical steps fine it's not just one reaction what are they called so we have the light dependent stage now this is quite wordy what does it do it involves the photo activation of chlorophyll and the transfer of energy to produce and this is key what does it do it produces atp and reduced nadp and this takes place on and across the thylakoid membranes of the chloroplast. OK, so think about where we are. So we're talking about our, our point of interest here is the thylakoid membranes. That's where the light dependent stage takes place. The light independent stage involves the fixation of carbon dioxide and the use of ATP and reduced NADP. So you've just produced them in the light dependent stage. And the reason we produce them is so we can now use them in the light independent stage and convert that fixed carbon dioxide into glucose. It takes place in the stroma of the chloroplast. So this is where we're interested in for the light independent stage. Right. Let's now have a look at these photosystems. So go back to those photosynthetic pigments. We've established now that they are found within the thylakoid membranes of the chloroplast. But they're not just dotted randomly, they're actually grouped in clusters of many hundreds, and those clusters are referred to as photosystems. Now, a photosystem is made up of two parts. Okay, so those are these two um, representations of a photosystem. Um, <coughs> so, first thing, it has what we call a reaction center. The reaction center is a chlorophyll A molecule found within that photosystem it's denoted there in the middle of the photosystem which is just fine but it also has a whole load of other pigment molecules we refer to these as um, accessory pigment molecules we've got chlorophyll a's chlorophyll b's accessory pigment molecules that surround the reaction center and collectively these are referred to as the antenna complex so now if you remove the reaction center we're ignoring that everything else in a photosystem makes up the antenna complex and if i just take that back a moment you can see in this antenna complex on the right hand side i'm seeing loads of different colors i'm seeing um, a uh, uh, 
uh, chlorophyll A, chlorophyll B. I've seen carotene, seen xanthophyll. I've seen brown there. I've seen like a purple, which is like it's fluorophytin. Other different pigment molecules. The point is, there's lots of different colors. Though it is largely chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B. Those are the main colors we see in blue, green, and yellow, green. Note that the whole thing is referred to as a photosystem, and a photosystem is made up of an antenna complex and a reaction center. Now, what makes that chlorophyll A molecule in the reaction center different from all the other chlorophyll A molecules? It's simply because it's associated with a protein molecule. Now, that protein molecule is going to function as an electron acceptor later. But, you know, when you look at that diagram of the photosystem, you say, well, I see a chlorophyll A molecule in the middle, but I'm seeing it elsewhere. What makes that special is because it's associated with a protein molecule. OK, so that's what makes it special. That's what makes it a reaction center. OK. Another opportunity here, I'll have a quick uh, chance to have a go at these. OK, so. We've got um, light dependent stage now, here we go. Photosynthetic pigments, photosynthetic pigments are found in the thylakoid membranes of the chloroplast, grouped in several clusters of several hundred molecules called photosystems. A photosystem cons consists of a central chlorophyll A molecule termed a reaction center, and then hundreds of other molecules, these accessory pigments surrounding the reaction center. Collectively, they are referred to as the antenna complex. And the chlorophyll A molecule is different from other chlorophyll A molecules because it is associated with a protein, which itself functions as an electron acceptor. And we're talking about this chlorophyll A molecule in the reaction center. So let's have a look at what happens, the sequence of events that takes place inside a photosystem. So whole job is to capture light. How does it go about doing that? So the first thing is that light strikes a pigment molecule somewhere in the antenna complex. OK, so a photon of light um, hits one of those pigment molecules in the antenna complex. Now, what that does is it causes electrons within that pigment molecule to become excited. They're raised to a higher energy level and now they've got loads of energy. They're excited. And that energy can then be transferred to a neighboring pigment molecule and will do so. That energy is transferred from pigment molecule to pigment molecule and transferring that um, excitation energy. So electrons are not transferred. You can see in this diagram there, this animation, that electron from that first pigment molecule is still there. But the energy has been transferred to a neighboring pigment molecule and that continues. That energy is transferred to the next pigment molecule and the next and the next and the next and it keeps going until it reaches the chlorophyll a molecule in the reaction center now at that point that excited electron is accepted by this associated protein molecule so that's a key aspect to that that that, that once that that electron within the reaction center chlorophyll a gets excited then that electron does get passed on so with all the other ones, the electron is not being passed on from pigment to pigment. It is simply the excitation energy which is being passed on. At the reaction center, when that electron receives that excitation energy from one of the accessory pigments, then it will pass on those electrons to an associated protein molecule. OK, again, you can pause as always. We can have a quick look at what's going on here. So role of a photosystem to capture light energy. During this process, light absorbed by a pigment molecule within an antenna complex. This causes electrons within the pigment molecule to become excited, raising them to a higher energy level. This energy, energy, not an electron, this energy is transferred to a neighboring pigment molecule and will continue to do so until the excitation energy reaches a chlorophyll A molecule within the reaction center. Here, the excited electron is accepted by an associated protein molecule, and that protein molecule is an electron acceptor. Now, again, I'll run through this quickly because you can pause this and you can have a go at putting these in order. Um, it's quite a nice activity to try and do. You can always pause at this point and have a go at which get what's the order, but I'm going to show you these in a moment. OK, so number one, light hits a leaf. The photons of light enter a chloroplast and reach the thylakoid membranes. 
A photon strikes a pigment molecule within an antenna complex. Electrons within the pigment molecule are excited as the photon of light strikes. Excited, electrons are raised to a higher energy level. Energy transferred to a neighboring pigment molecule, and this continues until the excitation energy reaches a chlorophyll A molecule within a reaction center. And here the excited electron is accepted by an associated protein molecule. Protein molecule. Right, so let's have a look at the type of question we might expect to see here. As always, you can pause, but we will press on. So key thing to be wary of here, um, that's really common that pupils will put down the answer this A or B, usually A is a photosystem. Uh, and it's not, it is, well, this is the mark scheme. So it's telling you what other things you could say, but what we would say here is an antenna complex. Okay, given what I've said, uh, the way I've pitched it, there's other things you could say, but the antenna complex is be the likely thing to say. And then the uh, B is either reaction center or you can say that chlorophyll A. You can, it's the, the option of a reaction trap. No one's saying that really. Reaction center or chlorophyll A. You know, getting used to the way in which um, uh, mark schemes work is a very useful skill. And it takes a bit of time, but it's, worth, it's, but it's worth working on. Not only does it allow you to be a bit more independent in um, doing past paper questions, but also you can see what else they are accepting. Um, this is actually of quite an old past paper question, but the more modern ones, you can certainly read an awful lot into what answers they're accepting. And if you didn't say that, you may, you may even have got full marks, but it's still worth seeing what other answers are being accepted. Identify two pigments you would expect to find in region A. Well, they allow chlorophyll A, chlorophyll B, um, carotene and xanthophyll. I think if it was me, I would, um, I don't think I would have said chlorophyll A. <sighs> only because I know I, that I may well have answered chlorophyll A for this part here, but carotene, xanthophyll, and um, the chlorophyll B. Yeah, but the, the danger is not, not to say, um, if you just say chlorophyll, that might not be enough. It does. It is enough to get the mark here, but you're gambling if you just said chlorophyll. And where would you expect to find photosystems? Well, that's in thylakoid membranes. Okay, so you can see there's other things that are on there, but really um, uh, it's thylakoid membranes, but note, uh, it's not showing on here. Well, I'm hiding it. There's a two mark question there. This is something that's really common. I'll just take that off. You see, describe exactly where you expect to find photosystems. Quite often, this is not uncommon that they have something in bold there, precisely in bold. And the fact that there's two marks saying that you're not going to mess with this, you need to give lots of, uh, you need to give precise detail here. So just saying thylakoid membrane is a gutsy move. Really, you should be referring to chloroplasts uh, too. So as always, look at the number of marks on offer. OK, and then, and then cater or um, compose your uh, answer accordingly. Right, OK, so where are we up to? We've covered the basics of photosynthesis. Excellent. We've looked at photosystems and now we need to get on to the business end. So we've got about 15 minutes left, which should, should give us enough time to cover non-cyclic photophosphorylation, um, uh, I hope at the very least. So. Here is my representation of non-cyclic photophosphorylation. So the first thing we need to do is just get a measure of what on earth we are looking at here. So there I've got the um, diagram of a chloroplast backup. OK, um, I've got a thylakoid membrane shown on here. and You can see where those thylakoid membranes are. I've got a thylakoid space, which is the space inside a thylakoid membrane. And then I got the stroma, which is on, which is outside. So imagine um, looking at um, the top line here of this this little projection that's coming out there. We've got the thylakoid space underneath. We've got the stroma above it. So I've got stroma, then a thylakoid membrane, the black line, and then just underneath that, I've got the thylakoid space. Okay, so it's worth keeping that in mind. That's where we're that's where we're talking about here. Um, I've taken that away. What else have we got on here? Well, I got this molecule, which you should um, recognize from respiration. This is ATP synthetase. It's a stalked particle. Whilst we associate ATP synthetase certainly primarily with um, respiration, we see it again here. Because remember what we're trying to do here in the light dependent stage, we are trying to make ATP. So we're going to need ATP synthetase and we've got to make reduced NADP, which is um, 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 a separate part to this. What else have I got on here? I've got two photosystems. Okay, now 
there are two types of photo systems, photo system one and photo system two. Photo system one was discovered first and yet it appears second in non-cyclic photophosphorylation. Um, so we begin with reference to photo system two, but it does seem a little bit weird in that respect because photo system one was discovered first. Um, what are we talking about with the photo system? Why is it looking like this? Well, it doesn't look like it doesn't look like this sort of funnel shape, but I'm representing it like that. It's sort of artistic representation because it's useful to do so because we've, we've just referred to that. This idea that that energy gets channeled in towards a reaction center. So even when we look at uh, this photo system, we can see there's an antenna complex, which is so the triangular shape and the circle shape at the bottom is meant to represent the reaction center. The whole thing is a photo system. So we've seen that before. They all do have, um, they are represented in a different way. Photosystem two is referred to as P680 because that's where its absorption peak is at 680 nanometers. And photosystem one is referred to as P700 also. So sometimes you see it referred to as uh, photosystem one, sometimes just as P700. Worth keeping that in mind. Now, so what happens here? <coughs> I have electrons, which are, we we'll go back to, so let's go on to the process of what happens. I'll show that again. So light hits that photosystem, and this is just like we showed, isn't it? The electrons become excited, and this is showing the electrons moving, which is a little bit misleading. Uh, but ultimately, ultimately, those electrons end up in the reaction center of photosystem two. We've covered this already, and get accepted by an electron acceptor, that protein molecule associated with the chlorophyll A molecule within the photosystem reaction center. So now we do have, so we had energy being transferred from accessory pigment to accessory pigment. That energy eventually got to the reaction center. And those electrons in the reaction center, just like all the others, got excited. But now this time, those electrons, having been raised to a higher energy level, are accepted by an electron acceptor. Now from there, those electrons then get passed down a chain of electron carriers. So these electron carriers are very similar to the electron transport chain that we saw in respiration. Okay, there's a lot of similarities here. It's the same principle that's happening. Those electrons are going to be passed along that chain of electron carriers. And as it does so, protons are pumped from the stroma into the thylakoid space. Now, in exactly the same way in respiration that protons are pumped from the matrix of the mitochondria into the intermembrane space, now we're getting protons being pumped um, from the stroma into the thylakoid space. So within this chain of electron carriers, we would see an intrinsic protein which is functioning as a proton pump. It is worth noting that questions on photosynthesis often don't refer to ATP synthetase and often don't refer to proton pumps. It's not always the case, but they often they don't. It's sort of glossed over often in photosynthesis. We just have, it's not uncommon to show it, these electrons moving down this chain of electron carriers and ATP being made sort of at that point. That's not what happens. As they move down the chain of electron carriers, protons are pumped into the intermembrane space and ultimately we end up with a greater concentration of protons. I think I said intermembrane there. I'll say that again. So as the electrons move down, the protons are pumped from the stroma into the thylakoid space, and ultimately we end up with a greater concentration of protons in the thylakoid space compared to the stroma. So what happens? Just like we saw in respiration, those protons flow through ATP synthetase. Okay, they're not pumped through, they flow through. You could say they move through, but it's a passive process that um, no energy required for that to happen. And on the contrary, energy is liberated when that happens and that energy is used to combine ADP with phosphate to form ATP. Now think back to what we're trying to do in uh, the light dependent reactions. We want to make ATP and reduced NADP. Well, we've just ticked off ATP. We just made that, but we're not done. So, now that we've made the ATP, we've got to think, how are we going to make this reduced NADP? Well, we have the same thing happening now in photosystem one. Those electrons are raised to a high energy level, pass down to the reaction center, and then the electron in the reaction center is not only raised to a high energy level, but is accepted by an electron acceptor again. Same thing's happening. At this point, now, the NADP combines or picks up that 
electron, it picks up a proton, and it forms reduced NADP. Okay, so now I have at any point here made reference to the number of electrons, the number of protons in this case. It's it's not really important. Um, this is why I always refer to um, reduced NADP as exactly that, reduced NADP. You may well have seen it as NADPH, NADPH2. Both of those are perfectly acceptable as well. Um, I think strictly speaking, it should be written as NADPH plus plus H plus. But you see the, the consequence of having to refer to it like that, it's a bit of a mouthful. So I repeatedly refer to it as reduced NAD, which I've abbreviated it to red NADP, but it's reduced NADP. You will always be able to get away with calling it reduced NADP, but you should also recognize that when you see it written as NADPH or NADPH2, that means reduced NADP. OK, so you need to recognize them. You use whichever one you want, but I've for ease of um, uh, for ease of uh, explanation or description, um, I'm calling it reduced NADP. I'm just name ease of naming really is what I should say. So now we've made reduced NADP and we've made ATP. So just to clarify how we got that reduced NADP, NADP, which is present within the stroma, picks up that excited electron, that high energy level electron from the protein and then it takes with it or binds to the H plus ions and it forms reduced NADP. OK, all well and good. We've kind of done our job, but we're not finished because what we're now left with is a situation whereby both of these photosystems have lost an electron, so they need replacing. So how are we going to go about doing that? First thing is, um, we go back, we have this process called photolysis. Now look at where it takes place. It happens in the thylakoid space. It's a great place for it to happen for reasons I'll come on to. What is the equation for photolysis? We've got water that's broken down into two protons, half an oxygen molecule and two electrons. Now, in this case, the equation is probably a little bit more important to try and get right, but um, prob probably not essential in terms of numbers. If you just said that water is broken down into H plus along with oxygen and electrons, you'd probably be OK, but it's not a bad idea to to know uh, what the full equation is. And what's the point of those electrons? Well, those replace the electrons lost from photosystem two. Remember, those electrons went to the electron acceptor and then they passed down a chain of electron carriers. So it replaces those. Great. However, before we move on, however, what about the ones that have been lost from photosystem one? Well, that's all right, because those will be replaced by these electrons from photolysis. And as those electrons move down this chain of electron carriers, you will replace those electrons lost at photosystem one. So I did mention about why photolysis taking place in the um, thylakoid space is such a good idea. Firstly, it's proximity to photosystem two, fine. The whole idea here is to replace the electrons lost from photosystem two. So it needs to be nearby. But also look what else is generated. Two protons are generated. Now we're trying to get a high concentration of protons in the thylakoid space to end up with this electrochemical gradient um, between the stroma, uh, the thylakoid space and the stroma. So having a process which produces more protons in the thylakoid space is brilliant because we're getting a greater electrochemical gradient as a consequence of photolysis taking place in the thylakoid space. So where are we? There we are. We've done what we said we needed to do. We've produced ATP and we've produced reduced NADP. Fantastic. Let's do a little bit with that now. Let's give you a few moments to have a look at that and then we'll come back and go through it. So as always, you probably didn't have enough time and therefore you're always able to pause. Let's see what we should have had. So the nice thing about this, of course, is when we go back to that um, diagram here, um, well, it's all very well and good me explaining it to you, but actually you need to work towards explaining that uh, and you're not going to be able to, or it's 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 not normal. Whilst you can always draw an answer, or oh, it's, it's it's dangerous ground. I would always say, whenever students ask me, can I um, draw uh, what's going on? 
I always say, well, by all means, draw it. But then imagine you hadn't drawn it at all and write it out as well. So whenever I'm marking as an examiner, first thing I look at is what's written. And I'd like to give as many marks as I can then. And only then when I look at the diagram and say, is there any way I can give more marks here? Um, but the writing is what I would look to first. So, OK, what have we got here? Light hits photosystem two. Energy is transferred to a chlorophyll A molecule in the reaction center. I mentioned two high energy electrons, so I didn't talk about numbers there, but it is two, but it's not that important. And that's why the word I asked you to come up with there was um, electrons are released and they're picked up by an electron acceptor. We talked about that before. The electrons then passed along a chain of electron carriers and their energy, their electron energy, is used now to pump protons, H plus ions, from the stroma into the thylakoid space. As a result, an electrochemical gradient is generated. Now, this is stuff that's from respiration. This isn't new, it's from respiration. The um, protons, though, notice the way I've referred to them as H plus ions there, and I've referred to them as protons there. You can use either, okay? You need to be familiar with both. The protons flow out of the thylakoid space through ATP synthetase, so causes ATP and phosphate to combine to form ATP. Now, the electrons finish passing down the late chain of electron carriers and reach photosystem one. And again, light energy used to raise the electrons to a higher energy level, and they're accepted by an electron acceptor. These electrons then combine with, here we go, NADP and H plus ions or protons, you can say either, to produce reduced NADP. OK, we're kind of done, but we just need to sort out, well, what about those electrons which are lost? So in order to replace those lost from photosystem two, we get photolysis. Photo, so photo meaning light, lysis means splitting. So often it would be the full name is the photolysis of water, the splitting of water using light, occurs in the um, thylakoid space. Remember I said how useful that was and produces two protons, two electrons and half an oxygen molecule as it's shown there. This is the oxygen is released as a waste gas. It's kind of what we know, isn't it? We know that oxygen is released as a waste gas of photosynthesis. Whilst the um, H plus ions or protons produced contribute to the electrochemical gradient. Now, let's have a look at a possible question you could get here. Again, you can pause. Um, we've only got a few minutes, so I'll give you the opportunity to pause this here um, and I will crack on so that you can um, look at the answers. So this is a great example of the type of question you're going to get, whereby it does not look like what you've seen. Um, it's giving you a it's a representation of the light dependent stage and it asks you to name the light harvesting units one and two. So those are just photosystems. Name the process by which Y is broken down. So this is the problem. You've got to know this sequence of events so well that you can recognize Y. Now, Y is photolysis or, or sorry, Y is water. And how do we know? So from water, electrons are uh, released and used to um, replace those lost in photosystem two. Name X, Y and Z. Uh, so X is NADP. Uh, how do we know? Because it takes on board a couple of hydrogens to form um, NADPH or reduced NADP. Y is water, which we already established, and Z is oxygen. That's what's released as a waste gas. Name the particles P and Q. Uh, so P are those electrons and uh, Q are protons. Remember those protons that released from water ultimately pass through ATP synthetase, end up in the stroma and can combine with NADP. Function of A1 and A2, those are the electron acceptors. So you can say donate in. The normal thing is to say it's an accepted electrons, but you're always allowed both. Which of the compounds shown is used in the light um, independent stage? Well, remember the whole idea of light dependent is produce ATP and reduced NADP. For the light independent stage, the only one shown there is XH2 or NADPH2 or reduced NADP. And what's the function of this? Well, OK, that's for next time. It's a source of reducing power. It reduces the CO2 to help with fixation. Right, OK, that is a suitable place to stop because next time we will move on to cyclic. If I go back to our plan for today, um, we've just covered non-cyclic photophosphorylation. On the next installment of photosynthesis, we are going to do cyclic photophosphorylation and look at those products jointly that you get from cyclic and non-cyclic and see the role in the, of those in the light independent stage and ultimately result in the uh, production of glucose. 
So we are done for today. I hope to see you next time. Thanks very much.